Good morning, good evening for everyone. This is Alejandro Pérez speaking, and I welcome you to this new edition of ICC webinars. And today, with the special um, luck of having Joseph O'Connor, our co-founder and master trainer, presenting uh, coaching for, uh, team coaching for high-performance teams. So I'm I'm sure you will welcome the new ideas and, and innovative perspectives about team coaching. And then I welcome Joseph, so we can we we'll get started today. Joseph, welcome and thanks for running this webinar with us today. Thanks, Alejandro. Uh, hi, everybody. And, and my apologies for uh, lateness. I had some trouble connecting. I'm actually in Japan at the moment, uh, so not not in home, not home at London. Um, so there, there have been some problems. Anyway, uh, we're and we're going to be talking about. Uh, Team coaching, which is a big subject, an important subject, a subject that is becoming more and more important in business as business switches more from individuals to teams to get things done. And of course, uh, to preview the team coaching that we will be doing in Bali in Indonesia uh, in November, between the 7th and the 12th of November. So I want to tell you a little bit about the, the team coaching and how it works and our, our approach, ICC approach to team coaching. Uh, this, this training does have a European quality award uh, awarded by the, um, the European Coaching uh, Council. European Mentoring and Coaching Council. So which means that it, it uh, has, the high, has passed the highest quality um, kind of it's kind of benchmarked against um, university courses, so it has high quality assurance, and that's great because um, it's important now that all coaching trainings do have high quality assurance. So I want to show you some tools. I want to talk a little bit about team coaching, and um, then there'll be some time for some questions at the end. So. Well, what is team coaching? <laughs> Let's start with the definition. So it's it's about helping the team. If you're a team coach, you help the team to improve their performance processes. So performance is what they do and the result of what they do. So it's their goals, their outcomes. Uh, it's the result for business and the processes that they go through. And high quality process will give high quality results. Poor quality process gives poor quality results. So the process is extremely important. If you, can in, if you can improve the processes of the team, in other words, how they work together, what they do, then this is going to make for big differences in what the team can achieve and therefore big differences in what the businesses can achieve through their teams. How is it done? It's through reflection action and dialogue uh, and I guess then reflection well then action probably uh, teams act they do things and then reflect on those actions and then dialogue again about that and so that goes around in a kind of little uh, little wheel um, kind of little system so you talk you act you reflect and you learn so that's kind of basic definition of team coaching. Plenty of benefits. Um, team, team coaching has grown much, much more now. Uh, it's become increasingly important and there aren't very many team coaching trainings. There's lots and lots and lots of individual coaching trainings. But team coaching trainings, no, very few, and none that I know of that has the international reputation of the ICC one. And team coaching is becoming more important. Team coaches can get business. Team coaches can get business in a way that individual coaches can't because they are not in so much competition. There is uh, lots and lots of, of individual coaches in competition for, for business jobs. Not so many team coaching. And 
the team coaches can make teams more effective so they can do their projects better they make more efficient teams so they do their projects quicker and with more economical use of resources so you want both of those you want effective teams you want them to actually do what they say they'll do and do it well but you don't want them to do it with using so much money and so much time that uh, it's bad for the business at the same time you don't want teams that use very little money very little time but don't get very good results so you need both and this leads or can lead and goes together with development of coaching skills in the organization so it kind of uh, starts to embed the values and the processes of coaching of asking questions of um, uh, of valuing people of uh, making sure people are well treated uh, of being open and kind of embeds those in the in the coaching culture so there's a big opportunity for team coaches more and more people in business are being told that they need to be good team players and that's all very well but they're not told how to they're not told how to be a good team player and it's not so easy and people don't know it takes some practice some skill some time to learn how to be a good team player in other words to be able to give your best so that the team can give its best and without that the teams aren't going to be very part of the job of a team coach is to help everybody to be a good team player to be the best team player that they can be so effective teams do a lot of things in business they can help succession planning they can be good for knowledge management they'll be more creative I've coached many teams particularly with that value from management management wants teams to be creative they want teams to come up with new things uh, in business competition is very great now and the advantage goes to those businesses that can come up with new ideas new ways of doing things that can be creative creativity is a very very valued resource in business and <laughs> it's one that is can be in short supply and it's one that's not so easy just to you know you can't go up to someone and say okay be creative them in an environment with people that will allow their creativity to flourish you can't force creativity you can't make people be creative but you can help them to be creative by stimulating them by asking them good questions by appreciating them and this is what a team coach will help to do with teams to make teams more creative and as I say that the team coaching training which is what we're going to be doing is a training specifically designed to help team coaches to be extremely good at all of those things and therefore to help businesses to gain those benefits and to perform better so what is a team well it's not a big person some coaches some people think that if you put a number of people together it kind of adds up to the same as a person but just more complicated or, or kind of bigger or harder to handle and that's not true at all when you add people together you get a different system you get people with relationships between each other and the more the relationships you have the more complex it can be so even with a team of three you can have relationships between three people you've already got six or seven possible relationships all of which are interacting with each other so it becomes much more complex once you have six or seven people or ten people in a team then you can't treat that team in the same way as you would treat a person so there are significant differences between your and how you mean and this is one of the first things that we do in the training so well what is a team so here's a good definition 
A team is a small number of people, I would say under 10. Uh, once you get more than 10, 12, they, it starts to break down into two teams. Kind of, it's, it's not very manageable once it gets past 10. They have complementary skills. In other words, they have skills that complement each other. They go together with each other. They don't all, they're not all good at the same thing. It's just like a football team. You don't want a football team that's full of really good goalkeepers because it won't do very well, even though everybody may be a brilliant goalkeeper or, alternatively, everyone may be a brilliant striker. Uh, it's not going to do very well because you don't want people who do all the same thing. You want people who do different things. So complementary skills committed to a common purpose. In other words, they have a goal. They have a goal that they share and that they're committed to. The performance goals are the, um, the kind of milestones on the way towards the main goal. In other words, if you need to produce a particular um, product in three months, then you need to have done a certain number of things by one month. You need to have met a certain number of things by two months and then you know you're on track. If after two months you haven't done that, you know you're off track. And so those performance goals, how you perform as you go along, will help you to keep track of whether you're going to get the goal in the end. So they're committed to the common goal, the performance goals, the goals on the way, and the approach. And the approach is about values. So very important in teams about sharing values, about mutual respect, about agreeing the kinds of uh, the kinds of ground rules really that they're going to operate by. And those ground rules are how you treat each other and how you are in the team. So for a team coach, it's very important to to treat the values just as much as to treat the goal. <clears throat> and they hold themselves mutually accountable. In other words, they they go together, they help each other, and they they are accountable, and they hold everybody else accountable. So it's fully accountable within the team. In other words, they feel a responsibility to get that goal, and they're pre they're prepared to challenge other team members to step up and to be the best they can be as well. Now, this is of course an ideal team. A team that, that did all that would be a great team. So part of the job of a team coach is to, as it were, help the to become a team like that. And the more they can approach that ideal, the better team they're going to be. <clears throat> so a team is a system. And a system is a group of elements that are connected together for a purpose. And it's worth remembering that it's a verb. A, te a team is a verb. A system is a verb. In other words, it's a group that does something. It's always doing something. It's always in movement. It's always in process. And it's very difficult for the team to, as it were, run on the spot. So the team is either going backwards or it's going forwards because it has to keep moving. That's what a system is. A sy the, the word system is a noun. It sounds like it's a thing, but it's not. It's something that has to continue to interact in order to maintain its existence, to continue in existence. So <clears throat> you've got to treat uh, a team as a, as a system. And that means then dealing with that kind of complexity. And in the training, we do quite a bit of systems thinking, systemic thinking about what are the qualities of a system? How does a system work? How does it work in practice? And what kind of lessons can we learn from that in practice um, in order to help the teams work in the best way? So systems thinking sounds rather uh, kind of almost mathematical uh, or kind of abstract, but it's anything but that. Um, 
it's about how people interact together and of course wherever there's thinking there's also feeling so systems feeling as well how do people's feelings interact with each other and how do people interact and how do they feel about that so there's plenty of emotion involved too So there's different sorts of teams, um, leadership teams like uh, boards of directors, departmental teams, managers that run departments, mid-management teams, action teams, teams put together for a one particular project uh, that's got to take action in one particular project, then maybe it's disbanded. Um, creative teams, teams that come together to create something or come together to continue to try and get creative ideas which they then give over to the action teams. So there's plenty of different sorts of teams, just as sorts of, of uh, individuals for coaching. But the process of team coaching, it doesn't matter what sort of team it is, the process of team coaching in order to get the best from the team, which is getting the best from the people in the team, is going to be uh, the same. So <clears throat> by learning the, the fundamentals, um, the, the key core skills of team coaching, you can coach any type of team regardless of actually what it's doing. Virtual teams, these are now, of course, much more common. Virtual teams, may the people may be in different countries. Uh, you may never meet your team member in person. You'll meet them on the internet. You'll meet them by webcam. You'll meet them by Skype or whatever it might be. So there are special um, challenges um, as well as advantages dealing with virtual teams. And it, you need to know how to coach virtual teams, so teams that are not in the same room together. Uh, that's an increasingly important part. So it's not just about teams that are in the same room, it's about teams that work together, uh, maybe all over the place. Different sorts of teams as well. You can have teams with membership that's unstable. In other words, you can have teams where the members are changing a lot of the time. And you can have teams where the members are the same over long periods of time. So for example, uh, unstable membership would be a team, um, a flight uh, cabin attendants, you know, a flight crew. So you go on an airplane and you'll have a pilot, co-pilot, maybe two co-pilots, uh, purser, cabin crew, six or seven people depending on the size of the aeroplane. And that's a team and that team has to do things and it has to do them very well uh, because flying an aeroplane and getting many hundreds of people from one place to the other is uh, an important job and those things have to be done extremely well. But the team is never the same different pilot, different co-pilot, different people on the cabin crew. So the focus there is on the system of what they have to do, the goals that they have to accomplish, very much so. <clears throat> you can also have uh, teams that are unstable membership, but they also have changing tasks all the time. You know, Not only do the team members change, but also the things that they do change all the time, like a SWAT team. You can also have teams with unstable, well, stable membership. In other words, the, the members stay pretty much the same over a long period of time. And you can have those teams that will do tasks that stay the same. So same people, same thing, <laughs> day after day. They've got to do it well, but uh, that's pretty stable. Or you can have stable membership that has also tasks like a committee or a board of directors, same people but they are faced with different kinds of challenges all the time. So these, those are kind of four main types of teams that you may meet and it's useful to be able to know what kind of team you're going to be coaching. And of course you also need to be thinking about if, if you're 
wanting to be a team coach in business. Um, the practicalities of how you go about coaching these different sorts of teams, how many sessions you have, um, what you charge, uh, how, you're, how you're with them, how you support them when you're not there, um, how long the team, how long, uh, over what period of months or weeks will you actually be coaching them, um, and what type of coaching is that going to be, and whether you're going to give individual um, coaching sessions to the team members as well. These are all kind of practices that need to be covered in any team coaching training. So who's a team coach then? Who's this uh, amazing magician that is able to do all of these things after being trained? So here's a little metaphor that I like anyway, and you can see the picture. It's about a, a wise man uh, in the desert, and he comes into an oasis in the desert on his camel, and he sees that uh, there's a lot of people fighting. Uh, in particular, three brothers are fighting uh, over what they're going to get and so he comes in and he asks what's going on and the brothers tell him that uh, their father's just died and the father has left all the wealth of the family to the three sons and the wealth of the family consists of 17 camels because camels are very, very important in the desert. So 17 camels is a lot of wealth. But 17 camels, uh, three sons, they really don't know how to divide them. The father said that the eldest son should get half of the, the wealth, the middle son should get a third of the wealth, and the youngest son should get one-ninth of the wealth. But uh, that really doesn't work with 17 camels, they can't make the maths work and they don't want to cut up the camels because <laughs> if you cut a camel in half that doesn't leave you with two half camels, it leaves you with one dead camel. That's the thing about a system. So they're, they're fighting away about exactly what they're going to do and the, uh, the wise man says, okay, well look, I've got a way around this. Uh, let me give you my camel. Here you are. You can have it. It's all yours. I, I give it to you freely for nothing. So the, the sons say, well, thank you. Okay. So now you've got 18 camels. Yes, 18 camels. Okay. Well, the eldest son, you were going to get half of the wealth, weren't you? So, yep, said so the eldest son. Yep, half of the wealth. Okay, so half of 18 is nine. So you get nine camels, so they measure out nine camels across to the eldest son, so he's happy. Middle son, one third of the world, so one third of 18 is six, so middle son gets six camels, he's very happy. And the youngest son, one ninth of the wealth, so that's two camels, because there's 18 camels, so one ninth of that is two, so he gets two camels. So one son gets nine, one son gets six, and one son gets two. And that adds up to 17. So there's one left over. And that leftover camel is the wise man's camel. So he says, well, I guess my camel's left over. I guess I'll take it back if you don't mind. And um, I'll be on my way after you've maybe given me some food for settling your, your problems. So I, quite, I like that metaphor because it's a good metaphor for a coach. A coach is, is someone who comes in uh, with, a, with resources and, and with wisdom and gives that to people who may be in, in conflict or difficulty, and a conflict or difficulty, but loses nothing. Gives something, loses nothing, and then can just continue on their way, leaving happy people. So what's important in team coaching? Well, the position of the team coach, of course. Uh, the team coach is in a very special position because they are a team member, but they're also kind of outside the team. So they're kind of inside the team and outside the team. They're a team coach, they've got a job to do, but they're also a team member. They, they participate.
in what the team go, does. <clears throat> they help the team with the team goal. They help the team with the team values. They help the team through any possible difficulties or obstructions, problems, conflict, and they help the team to uh, marshal their resources together. So those are the four main important things that the team coach does. Deals with the goal, deals with the values, deals with the problems, and deals with the resources. So a, a team coach going all the way through will uh, help the group of people to become a team because uh, people don't just put a group of people in the same room doesn't make them a team. Uh, they have to start agreeing on things, they have to start agreeing on their goal, agreeing on their values, working together, respecting each other. So the team coach helps that process to begin. Uh, it coaches, they coach the team through any conflicts that may occur and probably will occur. And nothing wrong with conflicts, conflicts is an inevitable part of team building. It's what you do with the conflicts and whether they are constructive or destructive that's important. So it helps with the conflicts, helps the team to move along, hopefully helps the team to become a high performance team. They kind of guard the values, they, they kind of guard the goal and the values. They, they keep the team focused on the goal and they remind the team about their shared values uh, if any conflict comes up. One particular tool that we use um, is what's called the goal grid. So if you're thinking about goals and the kind of overall uh, ways that goals fit into the system, then you can think about what you want and what you don't want. So obviously a goal is something you want. But there'll be things you don't want as well. There needs to be some risk assessment. There needs to be some uh, obstructions to, some risks to eliminate. So it's not at all negative to think of what you don't want. You need to, to deal with that. And then also you, there is what you have and what you don't have. So you can see the way this works. It's an interesting um, analysis way to analyze goals and we do a lot with it in the team coaching um, including looking for leverage points which is the place where you can do something to get the most result with the least effort. So you can see what you have and what you want that's in the top left corner that's what you want to keep that is your resources um, that is your um, strengths. You, there can be things you want but you don't have, so that's what you want to achieve, that's the bottom left corner. That's going to be your main goals of course. It also may be resources that you haven't got and you need to get. Um, it could be opportunities as well. You don't, have, you know, you want to, you want to get them. You don't have them, but you want to, you want them. And then, if you go across to the top right, things that you don't want but you have, you want to eliminate. You want to get rid of them. They are the stones in your suitcase. They are the the, the weights in your backpack that hold you back. So those are the weaknesses that you want to get rid of. And then there's also things down in the bottom right of what you don't want and what you don't have. So those are the risks, those are the things to avoid, those are the possible difficulties you want to make sure, the, the kind of traps and the holes that you don't want to fall into. So that's the threats. So you can see that uh, this goal grid is a kind of bit more sophisticated way of looking at uh, what is often called a SWOT analysis, S-W-O-T, which is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. But you can be much more sophisticated about that in terms of how you analyze that and how you do that with teams. So it's, an in it's a very interesting tool. <clears throat>
and one of the tools that we use. So what else? Stages of development, very important in a team. Teams go through stages in ways that individuals don't. So if you're coaching an individual, an individual is not going to go through kind of stages of, of being an individual as you coach them. But teams do. And you need to be able to change your coaching style depending on the stage of development. Creativity, being able to foster and uh, help the team to be creative. To balance between task and relationship, in other words, to keep focused on the work, but also to have a good time, also to have a good relationship with each other in the team. Some teams get very focused on work, don't have a good time. Some teams get too focused on having a good time, they don't do the work, and, and neither of those is very helpful. So there's a balance there to be had. Uh, there's also important things about are you an internal or an external team coach. In other words, are you a team coach who is already inside the organization or are you a team coach who is hired from the outside in order to coach the team. And of course, all those things about high performance, this is what you're heading for. Uh, you want to make that team the best possible that they can be. And as I said, there is going to be conflict. Conflict means that people don't agree with each other. It may be about the goals, it may be about the values, it may be about the roles that they have, it may be about uh, they just don't feel very good at the time, they kind of get angry or um, anxious or different sorts of feelings can come up. And the team coach needs to be good at that, needs to be able to deal with conflict and be able to resolve it in ways that help the team to move forward and not in ways that help the team to kind of distract, self-destruct. So that's quite important and we have, we'll learn quite a lot of uh, ways that we can do this to make sure that conflicts are dealt with in a good way and to keep them from blowing up because you don't want a conflict to blow up and blow the team up. You need to get it before that happens. Emotional space. Um, let me say a little bit about emotional space because I think it's something quite interesting. Uh, emotional space is how the, how you arrange yourself in space, the distances between people and the kind of relationships between people in space actually reflect their relationship. In other words, uh, people who don't like each other, we tend to say that they're distant. Right? Uh, people who do like each other, we tend to say that they're close. So how close and how far away people are from each other can give you clues about how they stand with each other, how they feel with each other, and how the team disposes itself, sits down, uh, whether you have a table or whether you have chairs or how you sit. It's not random. There are patterns. There are patterns of how people sit and how they like to sit and where they want to sit. And there are patterns that work and there are patterns that don't work. Where it's good for the team coach to be and there are places where it's not good for the team coach to be. So understanding that use of emotional space is something that's very interesting, uh, very important, and uh, I don't know anywhere else that is teaching that with regard to team coaching. So if we're talking about emotional space, then Individual space, you have the intimate space, uh, which is close to the person. You only let very important people into that space. <laughs> um, people you allow into that space, people that you're intimate with. If somebody comes up close to you that you don't like, then you, in English we say they're in your face. They're too close. You, you say back off. There's the personal space which is just people that you're talking to, that you feel comfortable with, and then there's a social space. Um, 
where just people are and it doesn't mean anything particularly. Those spaces do tend to be culturally different, they're different between cultures. Uh, the space tends to be a little bit bigger in European and English culture and a little bit closer in Latin American cultures, as you might expect. But the idea that there is intimate space, there is personal space and there is social space uh, is common to every culture because <laughs> human beings, it's just common to human beings. So, the whole idea in the end is to be able to be a coach that can create a really great high performance team. And our team coaching course is experiential, in other words you do a lot of, a lot of work in teams. It's not just teams, you actually learn by doing it in teams, so you're living it. You're, you're, you're learning how to, to build teams, you're learning how to coach teams, and you're learning how to be a good uh, member for teams, team member. So that's a kind of very quick tour of uh, team coaching, very quick tour, just kind of the big picture really. Um, so open for any comments or questions uh, that anybody might like to come up with. Uh, either you put up your hand and, and if it's possible Alejandro will, will plug you in and you'll be able to, to say the question out on air, I can answer that. Or you can put up your hand, you can uh, write questions in the question box and uh, Alejandro will read them out to me. So over to you with regard, anything with regard to what is a team coach, how, how the training works, what you can get from the training, benefits of team coaching, anything like that. Many thanks, Joseph. So we have just the, the first questions arriving. Um, mm -hmm. I go for the first one from Mar. She's, he or she is asking, when we are new as a leader in a new team, how can we know their values to guide them to make decisions according to them? Uh, you, you can't know it in advance. If you're a team leader and there's an existing team and you're put in as a team leader, this is a very difficult, actually, it's a very, very difficult situation because the team know each other already, they've worked together already, they've probably worked out their values and then you're coming in. If you're supposed to be a team leader then you are you have some authority, uh, so there's a tendency for you to be regarded as the enemy <laughs> at the beginning, <laughs> because you're, you're, you're coming in, it's just like any group, you imagine a group of people and then someone new comes in, um, you know, you're not going to be accepted straight away, so you need to tread quite carefully, uh, and you, what you need to do is to find out what the team's doing, what the team values are, how the team is working be very accepting, first of all, very listening, listen carefully, don't try and impose anything, find out what the team is like, what, what they're doing, how they think, and then once you've done that and you've started to be accepted because you haven't been throwing your weight around, then you can start to work more with the team and if they see that you are really listening and you, you really want to be part of the team, then they are much more likely to accept your leadership uh, and your authority. Thanks Joseph, so thanks to everyone for, for the questions we are receiving and there are several ones. So we go for the second one, uh, it's from Sam. How could we develop team coaching skills? How can you develop coaching skills? Develop. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, develop what? Team coaching skills. Oh, team coaching skills, sorry. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> the, the quick and easy answer is come to the training, come to the ICC training. Um, you will certainly develop team coaching skills there. Uh, Otherwise, it's difficult 
because in all, you know you can you can read about it. There there are some books uh, you can read about team coaching. There actually aren't very many books. That's another area where there really isn't very much literature. Um, but that doesn't help you do it. It's a bit like reading about uh, martial arts. You know, you can read about it and you can kind of understand it from the outside. On a mat, uh, remember I'm in Japan, so my, here's the metaphor of martial arts and judo. Put, <laughs> I can read a lot about judo, uh, I can understand it, but put me on a mat with someone who's good at judo, they'll throw me all over the place. I, my reading won't help me to actually uh, have the skills of being a good martial artist. In order to do that, you need to practice. You need to actually practice in a safe environment, like a team coaching training, where you can learn things, where you can try them out, uh, where no one's going to uh, punish you if, if it goes wrong. In fact, everybody's very supportive, everybody's learning together. So, you know, that's that's the answer really, team coaching training. It's um, I, I don't see another way to get team coaching skills uh, than that. Thanks, Joseph. So we go again to, to another. We go now to another question about the team size. Uh, if you have a company group of thirty people, we divide it in three. That's a question from Ellen. Uh, if you have a company of thirty people, you could divide it into three teams of ten. But a team's got to have a goal. So um, if you've got three important goals, then that's fine. But if you've got five important goals, <laughs> then you probably want five teams of six. And if you've got one important goal, then probably you might want to put a team of six or seven on it and everybody else is freed up to, to do whatever else they do. So it depends really on, on the goals. Uh, that's what's important with regard to a team. Team without a common goal is, is nothing. It, 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 it's, you can't really what a team is, it's a group of people with a common purpose. So think goal first, team does the goal, don't worry too much about the number of people. Great Joseph, so here it comes another question from Rajiv. His name, uh, my question is um, that a team it consists of individuals how to deal with individuals to bring them in a team? Do we need to have individual coaching in a team? Do we have individual coaching in a team? Well, you can. Uh, it depends. Some some team coaches, if, see, a team coach will be hired to make a team uh, as best they can be and probably to, that the team will get their goal quickly and, and, and effectively. So then how do you do that? Some team coaches will uh, coach individually everybody in the team as well. They'll have team coaching sessions, but they'll also have individual sessions with everyone. Uh, other coaches won't. Other coaches will simply only coach the team. Some coaches will coach the team leader separately. I think that's a good idea. If a, if a team has a team leader, I think it's very good to have an individual session with a team leader to find out what they're like because a good team leader can make a huge difference and a bad team leader can also make a huge difference in the opposite direction. Uh, so, you know, the answer is it depends. Um, I don't think you have to have individual sessions with every team member. Uh, if, if in circumstances, for example, where one member of the team was consistently uh, making problems, not doing the work, quarrelling with others, then I think you might take them and, and have individual session with them to find out what's going on. Because as long as they do that, it's going to disrupt the team and uh, they're not kind of really being part of the team. So you need to find out what's going on there and they may need some individual coaching to help them uh, to find out what's wrong, uh, the, why are they doing that behavior. So that would be another place where you would do individual coaching. 
Joseph, Joseph, we have a question from Gustavo uh, about the length of the team coaching. Uh, mm -hmm. He's saying, because companies want to create high-performance teams in short periods of time, is there any recommendation from your side regarding suggestions to teams? Yeah, get a team coach. <laughs> If you want to create a high-performance team quickly, uh, I would say get a team coach just you know just like an individual if you want to create a high performing individual if an executive wants to really turbocharge their development and charge their leaders uh, they get a coach they get an executive coach and if a team wants to go quickly from a group of individuals to a really high performance team that's working well effectively and creatively get a team coach you know that that would be my recommendation without a doubt does uh, and uh, we have a question from young yeah i'm sorry if i'm not pronouncing well the names it's just my ignorance about that So the, the, the question is, between coaching and lecturing, what's the difference? Could, we, could the subject be pre-customized and prepared and delivered as a, by a lecturer, for example? No, I don't think so. If I'm understanding the, the words right, a, a lecture is me talking to you, uh, telling you things. Uh, and it's it's a one-way passage, right? It's a one-way passage of information. I tell you things. A university lecture. Uh, you go to a lecture in order to be given knowledge by the lecturer. That's it. Now, coaching is quite different. Coaching is about uh, helping other people to be the best they can be, particularly by helping them by asking questions and challenging them and doing all sorts of, of interventions and with teams, you know, managing conflicts and everything else. So being highly interactive, and a lecturer is not highly interactive. A lecturer usually stands behind a lectern and lectures. <laughs> uh, a coach who doesn't stand behind anything, a coach jumps in, gets their hands dirty, uh, is in there with the, with the people, listening, being present, helping, asking questions, and really um, getting the, the person to be the best that they can be. So I think there's a big difference um, as I understand the word lecture. Thanks, Joseph. And um, We have an interesting question from Victor. He's asking, is it possible that a team coaching process shifts to an individual coaching process? If that happens, how we handle it? Sorry, I didn't catch that, Alexander. If a team coach does what? If a team coaching process can shift yeah. into an individual coaching process. Uh, so if that, ha handle, if that happens, how we handle that? I can't understand the question. If, if, you're in, if you're involved in a team coaching process, you're coaching a team. In other words, more than one pe person. If you're an individual coaching you're coaching one person so one can't turn into the other a team can't suddenly all melt down and become one person <laughs> so I don't think I've understood I don't think I've understood the question so Victor if you want to uh, given what just say if you want to re reframe the question we are open to read it again so um, let me go for another Um, just a second. Ah, here's one from Birgitta. She's asking, what knowledge do you need to enter the team coaching training? What knowledge? Um, well, I'll tell you what's helpful. Um, it's helpful to to have some knowledge of coaching. Um, if you've already done some kind of coaching training or you have some knowledge of coaching or you've done some coaching, this is great. Um, so that's one thing. It's good to have some experience of business because most team coaching is in the business context. Um, to 
some kind of experience with groups, uh, either as a teacher or a trainer or or someone like that, used to to deal with groups. Uh, so all of those things can help. Um, I, I don't think any of those any of those things are absolutely, you know. Well, put it this way. Um, if you're not a coach, you could still come to the team coaching training, but you would need to have some kind of uh, knowledge and, and skill from some parallel profession, management, consultancy, training, teaching, something like that. Something that, get, that gives you communication skills um, and the ability to deal with people. Otherwise, well, <laughs> you know, you're not going to do, you're not going to get on well in a team coaching training. So those are the sort of things that you need. Thanks, Joseph. We have uh, the the reframing of from Victor for the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's saying that in the process you might find problems produced by someone in the team, and then he's asking if it's advisable to coach this person, this individual personally, if the team coach can go personally with this individual. Uh, yes, yes, no, that's fine. Um, as I said before, uh, if you're doing team coaching, it's quite possible to take out any individual and give them individual coaching, usually the leader, sometimes someone who's causing trouble, or uh, sometimes you just coach everybody in the team individually just to, to help everybody along equally. So yes, that's fine. Great, thank you. And then... I think we, given the time, is it okay to do the one more question? Yeah, one more question. Okay. Um, just give me a second. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, we have another question here that it, maybe it's good to close. Uh, it's from Sam. Uh, would it really matter if there are both managers and their employees in the team coaching session? No, I don't think so. Uh, you usually you get a mixture in any business team anyway. Uh, the only problem there might be some if there are some managers who are more superior uh, in authority, they may find it more difficult to work uh, with others in a team because they feel kind of superior. That's the only possible difficulty. Um, but no, it's it's often a mixture and it, it works fine. Great. Um, Joseph, we have, I don't want to read one by one, but we have several questions about the, up, the upcoming team coaching training. Uh, sure. Can we say something about that? The dates, the length of the training, some details? Uh, that we can share with, with people in general and then maybe we can send detailed information after the webinar. Uh, yes. Um, the, the team coaching is in, uh, the next one's in Bali in Indonesia. Beautiful place. I'm looking forward to going there. Uh, it's the six days, November the 7th to the 12th. Um, it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, if you're not in the team coaching, there's a, there's a beach <laughs> and a swimming pool and all those nice things in which to relax and let the learning kind of settle and reflect. It's always nice to reflect on learning with a cold drink and a swimming pool and some sunshine. So six days, uh, usual sort of days from nine to six uh, with lunch there. Uh, lunch is, is part of the training. Um, I believe, maybe that's something I should check, but I believe lunch is part of the training. Um, the, there's practice in team coaching throughout. Uh, what else can I say? It's a great experience. It's, uh, it's a place where you can learn a lot about coaching and team coaching, where you can have a great time where you can um, practice skills that you won't get a chance to practice anywhere else. 
uh, in a beautiful place. I think it's great. Um, I'm, if there's any other specific questions, I'm very happy to, uh, to answer them. I think just if we cover that, it was mainly about dates, timing, how long it takes. Uh, so, uh, so far we covered then the, the questions we Yeah, okay. okay, good. Good, then um, that's fine. So here in, in Japan it's past 8 o'clock in the evening, so I shall have some dinner. And um, I hope to see many of you in Bali and time and attention. Many thanks, Joseph, then for the webinar. Thanks to everyone for being with us today. I'm looking forward, as Joseph said, to meet everyone in, in Bali. I wish. I, I can't believe <laughs> uh, <laughs> Until then, the, the, the next webinar, then. Thanks, Eddie. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye.